So our next speaker is uh, Dane Danielson from the University of Chicago. He's going to talk about how black holes decohere quantum superpositions. Please, Dane, or whenever you want, the floor is yours. Sure. Um, so yeah, I'm, as uh, uh, as was just said, I'm here to tell you about the fact that black holes decohere quantum superpositions uh, uh, positioned in their exteriors. Uh, this is based on work done in collaboration with Gautam Sadeshchandran and Bob Wald at the University of Chicago and uh, detailed in this uh, paper that I mentioned here uh, with uh, forthcoming generalizations that should be appearing on the archive in, uh, you know, within a matter of days, I, I think, at this point. Um, so uh, just to begin, uh, I want to just introduce some familiar facts that uh, in the Minkowski vacuum, it's impossible, it, it is possible to maintain the quantum coherence of a wave function occupying a superposition of different positions uh, by minimizing entangling radiation emitted by the superposed matter. Uh, so I'm assuming that this wave function carries some charge, so it is possible for it to radiate. And if you want to avoid decohering this superposition, you should avoid producing radiation from the superposition. Uh, where I've, I'm going to, throughout this talk, ignore additional effects due to, uh, I'm going to assume that we've sufficiently controlled the environment so that we don't need to worry about fluxes of particles streaming through uh, our laboratory or whatever. I'm just going to talk about an isolated uh, charged particle and its coupling to a uh, quantum field that might source radiation. Uh, so in the talk, I'm going to describe a new phenomenon whereby outside a black hole, any quantum spatial superposition of matter will suffer a constant rate of decoherence. Uh, and this decoherence is completely unavoidable and it'll persist uh, even if uh, the uh, uh, superposition is managed in such a way that the energy radiated by that superposition is absolutely minimized. Uh, you might think if you minimize the energy of the radiation, you would avoid decohering, but that's not the case. So, uh, to begin, I'm going to discuss a thought experiment in flat spacetime, uh, so uh, which will then lift to a black hole spacetime. So, in the thought experiment, we consider an experimenter, Alice, uh, that uses a Stern-Gerlach apparatus to carefully create a quantum spatial superposition of a charged body uh, carrying spin, and you can see the uh, the charged body is in red and the two different branches of the wave function are in the solid blue and dashed blue. And this is a space-time diagram that you're seeing here. So after a period of time t, uh, Alice would like to check that this quantum superposition that she's created has maintained its quantum coherence. Uh, so how can she do this? Uh, she can do this by uh, recombining, uh, very gradually recombining her superposition with a reversing stern gerlach apparatus, and then looking for signs of quantum interference between the two branches of the wave function uh, in the spin basis. So, uh, you know, at this event here, I'm circling with my cursor. Uh, you can imagine Alice looks to see whether there's interference. For instance, if it's a superposition in the Z direction of up and down, uh, as indicated in the diagram, she could look for uh, uh, she could measure the uh, spin about the x-axis, and if ever she measures the spin x to be down instead of up, she knows that she's decohered to some degree. Uh, there's one thing that Alice needs to uh, keep in mind, which I alluded to earlier, which is that uh, we're considering this particle to be either a massive particle or a charged particle. It's, it's coupling to some uh, field. Uh, whether it be gravitational or electromagnetic. And so in order to avoid uh, uh, decohering herself, uh, Alice needs to recombine the branches of her wave function sufficiently slowly that she doesn't become strongly entangled with the outgoing radiation states, uh, which I've indicated with these psi one and psi two states, uh, where the uh, psi one, is the radiation state corresponding to the spatial wave function A1, uh, and psi2 is the radiation state corresponding to the spatial wave function A2. 
So we can make this a little bit more explicit by just considering the states on uh, scry. So I'm going to, you know, draw this inside of a uh, is a is a uh, Penrose diagram. I'm going to draw this experiment, and these uh, radiation states can be taken to be states of the. I'll, I'll use the language of electromagnetism for the time being. There'll be states of the uh, electromag quantum electromagnetic field on Scry plus, and the decoherence that Alice will observe will be given by the orthogonality of the radiation states that the two branches of her wave function source, which you can measure by this kind of decoherence measure of one minus the inner product, the absolute magnitude of the inner product uh, between the radiation states. And if she does everything optimally, she can absolutely minimize her decoherence. That is, if she does the recombination very gradually to minimize this radiation, she can minimize the decoherence and set it to zero. Uh, so uh, just a little bit more quantitatively, if Alice's charge carry, if Alice's particle carries a charge Q and the superposition she made is of a size D, then to maintain coherence, uh, it would be sufficient to make sure that the two different radiation states, psi one and psi two, differ by uh, much less than one photon. So the difference between the two outgoing states is very small in photon number. Uh, and if Alice recombines sufficiently gradually, that is, if the time of over which she performs the experiment is much, much larger than the uh, dipole moment of her superposition, kind of the effective dipole of her superposition, uh, it turns out that's the condition that would be sufficient so that she avoids radiating these uh, uh, any, any, well, even one such entangling photon. Uh, and so this, in flat space time, she can always do this. She can always perform her experiment slowly and make sure that she doesn't decohere. This is precisely what we'll find becomes impossible in the presence of a black hole. Uh, so let's look at the black hole case and see how it differs. We, we do the, we're gonna be in the presence of a short shield black hole. Uh, I've indicated the interior region here. Uh, and the horizon is this H plus and scry plus now is just this, uh, this, uh, uh, null surface here, All right? So, and we're going to proceed exactly as before. But Alice is now in a laboratory held stationary outside of a black hole. You, sh you could imagine she's using rocket thrusters to keep her laboratory at a fixed radius in the exterior. Uh, there's one crucial difference, which is going to turn out to be the the important difference uh, in the case of a black hole, which is everything proceeds exactly as before if we consider this part of the diagram, but Radiation can now also propagate into the event horizon. And we need to make sure we take into account not only the state of radiation uh, propagating to scry plus, but also Alice's entanglement between her particle and radiation going to the event horizon. And so uh, notationally, you know, I'm, I'm gonna indicate as before the radiation states on scry plus with these psi states, but the radiation states on the event horizon now will be indicated by these phi states. And the decoherence will now not only be affected by entanglement with radiation at scry, but also with radiation on the horizon of the black hole. And the same argument as before applies to the radiation at scry. It will be possible for Alice to absolutely minimize her entanglement with radiation at scry, but it will not be possible for Alice, no matter what she does, to avoid emitting entangling radiation into the black hole. And so the optimal amount of decoherence, the least amount of decoherence Alice can have, uh, will be limited, uh, cannot be made zero. It will be uh, bounded from below by this amount of deco unavoidable decoherence that will be due to the ortho entanglement with uh, photons propagating across the event horizon into the black hole. Uh, so let's see why this is. Um, so if we look at the pullback of the electromagnetic potential uh, uh, from one branch of Alice's superposition, we can just consider a classical point charge following one trajectory of the two superposed trajectories. You'll see there's a, uh, it produces the, the pullback of the electromagnetic potential, you know, when the particle's initially at some radius B, it has some fixed value. Uh, Alice moves the particle to some new distance B plus D, uh, away from the horizon, 
uh, this is these B is a short shield radial coordinate, and then holds it for uh, some affine time along the horizon uh, delta V, uh, and then brings it back to its initial position. So that's the same procedure that we saw for one branch of the superposition. And, and Maxwell's equation, very good. Okay. So Maxwell's <laughs> equation on the horizon gives this relationship between radiation propagating into the black hole and the time rate of change of the Coulomb field so uh, on the horizon. So what we find is that Coulomb fields on event horizons give rise to radiation propagating into the interior. Uh, that is, I should say, time changing Coulomb fields on the horizon. But uh, the, you know, it, so we have this time changing Coulomb field that gives rise by Maxwell's equations to a change, a, a net change in the vector potential. Uh, and the Fourier transform of the vector potential kind of looks like a step function because it has this, this displacement by B plus D that then returns, which means that uh, the Fourier transform will go like one over omega in frequency space, which means that the number of, there will be a number of soft photons produced uh, that grows like the log of the affine time over which the superposition is created. So although the energy of the photons is arbitrarily small because it goes like one over omega and it'll grow, uh, the, the energy will be dominated by one over delta V photons, arbitrarily soft photons. They can, there will be uh, an arbitrarily large number of these arbitrarily soft photons in the presence of a black hole. So converting back into Alice's proper time, we find that there's a number of soft photons that grows linearly in her proper time that over which she maintains a superposition. And so for long T, uh, it'll be unavoidable that although Alice will, make, will emit an arbitrarily large, small amount of energy into the black hole, there'll be an arbitrarily large number of soft horizon photons lost into the interior. And you can plug in numbers for a charged particle. We find- Sorry, you're over, no, over time now, so please uh, wrap up. Yeah, so for a charged particle, uh, we find this estimate, which you can find in our paper, uh, about uh, for the amount of time that Alice can do a superposition outside a black hole. And the same effect holds for gravitation, for in the gravitational case due to superposed Newton fields. And uh, so what we find is that in, in essence, black holes harvest information about quantum superpositions outside their horizons by means of long range fields sourced by the superposed matter. And uh, eventually a black hole will decohere any quantum superposition in its exterior. And we think this has some importance for the, uh, any theory of quantum gravity. So thank you. Thank you, Dave, for your talk.